What's up, everybody? I am excited to announce a partnership with Audio Boom that's going to bring you a brand new spin on the Lawyer You Know podcast. We're going to be jumping into more cases than ever with different perspectives from special guests every week. Many of the cases we discuss will be brand new to the channel, but others will be some of our favorites. But the different spin is going to come when some of these guests will be lawyers you've heard from in the past, but most will be non-lawyers in my life bringing the true crime case they are obsessed with, spilling the tea, giving you and me the summary sometimes before asking me all their legal questions because I am the lawyer they know. And I guarantee you're going to have a lot of the same questions they have. We're jumping in with our first episode, September 16th, on a case we know Corey and love. spends the next year writing, working on a children's book about grief. The second episode is a case I knew nothing about, but Netflix did a documentary that took the world and this first special guest by storm. And I can't wait to break it down with them and you every week on the Lawyer You Know podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Lawyer You Know podcast, where we are going to jump into another new case for the podcast, but not a new case to the channel. And not a new guest, but a returning guest. Whitney, welcome. What's up? We have quite an episode today, quite a case that has captured your attention, I think for obvious reasons. Tell the people about Corey Richens, the child book author. Yes, the Utah mom, Corey Richens. I like to call this Hallmark turned snapped. Eric Richens, a successful very well-respected, outgoing, well-loved guy, owns an incredibly successful mason, stonemason business, frequents Home Depot because of his job. And who does he meet at Home Depot? None other than Corey Richens. She's young, beautiful, bubbly. They very quickly hit it off. They end up married. They have three boys together. They have a seemingly perfect, beautiful family, taking lovely vacations. She has a successful real estate business. He's doing really well at his job. He's coaching his three sons at their soccer games. Family man. Everything is seemingly beautiful and perfect until March 4th, 2022, when Corey Richens calls 911 because she finds her husband unresponsive, cold to the touch. After responders get there, they are unable to revive him. He is pronounced dead. The cause of death comes back as fentanyl intoxication five times the lethal amount. And you would think that when that happens, in a normal situation like this, when an investigation begins and a husband passes away, inner circle of potential suspects starts with the wife. But also, the last person to see somebody alive is in that inner circle. And in this case, who was that? Corey Richards, admittedly so. And yeah. she admitted to making him a Moscow mule or something right before bed. So she's also the person, the last person that prepared something that he ingested before he passed away unexpectedly. So all three strikes would be against Corey Richards. You would expect her to be out. You would expect her to get arrested right away. But what happens? Instead, Corey spends the next year writing, working on a children's book about grief and then goes on to a local news station to promote this book. She's making money off of this book. She's um, doing a lot of things that we find out behind the scenes to it's, ensure it's that she's financially set. It's literally <laughs> a book about helping kids grieve when their father passes away unexpectedly yes. and how you deal with that. Yes. So this is how sadistic this is. If it turns out right now she's presumed innocent, the trial hasn't happened yet, no convictions. But if it turns out she's convicted and she did this, how sadistic do you have to be to write a book and use your children and use the death of your husband, their father, knowing how horrible it is, writing a book about that kind of grief to make money, knowing what you did, if that is what happens, if the state can prove she did this beyond a reasonable doubt. And she clearly was not concerned with being a suspect. She was out there. She was moving money around, signing things. And then shortly after she is on the local news station, she is arrested. It, almost a year to the date of her husband's death, she is arrested for suspicion of poisoning her husband. So in all the other stuff in the background, which I'm sure we're going to get into, is... 
her real estate business that was seemingly successful was actually failing. Yes. She needed money to flip these houses. She wanted to buy this mansion, multi-million dollars. Eric wouldn't let her do it. Yes. She needed his money to be able to do it. He wanted to get a divorce, allegedly. She didn't want to because there was a prenup and she wouldn't have got as much money in the prenup. But if he dies, then she gets more money. She gets his assets that they own jointly. Potentially, she thinks she's going to get a life insurance policy. There are all sorts of things happening in the background financially that give her a very serious financial motive in this case. And it's one that the state has continued to present in court over and over again at detention hearings, at preliminary hearings. Every time they have the opportunity to show the financial interest Corey had in Eric's death versus just divorce. A lot of people in these situations are like, why don't they just get a divorce? Why don't they just separate? Why isn't that just an option? And in this case for her, financially, it just wasn't an option. The family um, has really said a lot in regards to Corey and they are hiding no feelings about the fact that they believe Corey caused the death of, of their brother. They have said that he told them, if I die, it's her. I, I want everyone to know if something happens to me, it is her. Um, his sister said that the day after his death, the next day, she closed on a house that everyone was pretty aware of that Eric did not want to purchase. She closed on a house. She hired a um, locksmith to break into her husband's safe. Um, she, I mean, she was busy. She was booked and busy the day after her husband died. It, it's literally like all of the things that you would think of with consciousness of guilt. She's Googling stuff, oh, by the yeah. way. I mean, yeah. What, what's some of the stuff she Googled? Do you, do you have any of it? Uh, luxury prisons for the rich. Um, she wanted, she was Googling how to, how to erase things off of an iPhone remotely. Um, how much fentanyl does it take to kill someone? I mean, the Google searches alone were incriminating, but the behavior, the way she was acting, it's, it's shocking to me. Again, she clearly had no thought that she was going to be found out. Yeah. And I mean, she, she certainly didn't wasn't acting. Nervous. Yes. She wasn't acting shy or, or nervous about anything. I mean, she was out there getting, yeah, getting yeah. it done. She did not seem nervous at all to me. Um, she seemed like she knew exactly what she wanted to do. And now that he was out of the way, she was going to do it. Um, and all of this would go to consciousness of guilt. The state's going to be able to get into a lot of this, the actions she took afterward, the financial plans and strings she was pulling beforehand. They've talked about that a bunch and we haven't even gotten into letters and text messages. Mm -hmm. So this is just kind of scratching the surface of what we know now that the state's going to be able to prove. And in all of these trials and all of these cases, you never know everything. If you're a lawyer on the case, if you're the state attorney, if you're a defense lawyer, you always know infinitely more than the public will ever find out. And this case is no exception. So we're just talking about the snapshot of this case that we have. And we know this is how bad it looks for Corey Richards. Now she has the right to stand there, presumed innocence. She's cloaked in the presumption of innocence. The state has to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. She has to do nothing to prove this case, but there's a lot here. There's a lot here that we have already seen. So where do you want to go next? Well, during, before she even is arrested, like it, it, within that year, um, as she's being investigated, Eric's family is telling them about other attempts that they felt that she was poisoning uh, Eric uh, uh, via a sandwich on Valentine's Day. They took a trip to Greece where he also had a near fatal reaction to something that she had made him. Um, then when they go to this hearing um, before the judge, the, the detention sis hearing you're talking about? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, this, this hearing is for them to present enough evidence to keep her in jail, a higher bond or no yes. bond because yes. she's either a danger to the community, a threat to run, um, that she's not going to show up. Those are the types of things that you usually argue when you try to keep somebody detained while waiting for trial. Because again, we're presumed innocent. 
So generally speaking, we should be out there, be able to prove our defense, but they don't want us running away as defendants or hurting other people if we're dangerous. What I felt was the most damning in that out of all, all of the testimony, everyone who spoke was Eric's sister. And when she said, she told the judge that Corey not only had taken life insurance policies out on Eric prior to his death. Oh, we didn't say, sorry to interrupt you. People always get annoyed if we interrupt each other. It doesn't bother me at all. So don't worry about if you interrupt me, but unbeknownst to Corey, he switched his insurance policy to have, is that what you were going to say? I, I wasn't going to say Yeah, I didn't think so. That. We didn't say it off the bat. So yeah. he switched the beneficiary of his insurance policy from Corey to his sister, which tells yeah. you something ain't right. Like yes. the husband, if he's like providing for his family and they've got businesses thriving together, they're both kind of in real estate and construction type work. Like, why would you switch the beneficiary? She has your three kids who you love and you've created together. Why would you switch your insurance policy? That's another thing that's happened. Um, and not only that, but he also had a business life insurance policy yes. with his business partner and he made him the beneficiary in the event that he died and vice versa, they could buy each other out of right. the business. Someone in, oh, in this time period logged in to their, to their account and switched it from Eric's business partner to Corey. Now they were alerted by the company that this change had been made. And so they were able to switch it back and never, he never discussed it with Corey after that. So again, they got it switched back, but there was a lot going on. And that brings me back to the most damning thing, in my opinion, from this was when the sister said that she had taken life insurance policies out on her children as well. And she brought it to the judge and said, I fear for their lives. I, I am fearful that she is a danger to those boys. If she has done this, if, if she's capable of this, what else is she capable of? And I, that to me was it. I mean, that I I'm thinking there's no way you can't let this woman go. You can't let her out. I mean, what, could, what is she capable of? Yeah. And she ends up staying detained, waiting for trial. Um, that was probably one of the reasons there are ways you can do it where you can still protect the kids, not in her custody, no contact mm -hmm. or no unsupervised contact, things like that. And, and that is damning. That's really damning. That's not something I would expect to come in a trial. And that's a good example of like a detention hearing. A lot of things are admissible that wouldn't be admissible at trial because her taking out insurance policies on her kids. I mean, maybe she, again, in her, in, in certain people's minds, maybe she would think that's good for her. Look, I took insurance policy out of my kids. I didn't do anything to my him. kids. So taking an insurance policy out on Eric doesn't necessarily mean I want to do something to him. I think more jurors would see it the way that you do, which is why I like to have non-lawyers to talk through some of this stuff with is like, as a lawyer, I'm like, Hey, Hey, that could be a good argument. But generally speaking, they would probably think the way you thought is that they were next. Um, and she used them for the book and she used them in other areas. We'll talk yeah. about too. Like this is one of those, but wait, there's more cases. Um, so, so you also mentioned some prior potential or alleged attempts on Eric's life by Corey. A lot of those wouldn't come in and those are just like suspicions with family and things like that, but they got her text messages. Mm -hmm. And one of the people they have text messages with is the person she ended up buying fentanyl from. We'll call her her dealer who's now informing and testifying against Corey Richards. And they were able to line up and corroborate her purchase of fentanyl right around the date of one of the prior attempts to poison Eric. And then after that, when it wasn't enough because he was eating a sandwich, he yep. felt the effects, stopped eating the sandwich, told her he was so sick, sick he needed to go to the hospital, which was unusual for him. And she's like, it's okay, just go ahead and take a nap. Then she asks, I need more. She gets more fentanyl right before in the timeline, he finally passes away in March. Yep. So they're able to line that up. And that was a lot of the evidence they presented in the preliminary hearing. And what a preliminary hearing is, is the opportunity for the state to present evidence to show that there's probable cause. So there's enough evidence against Corey Richens to take this case to trial. The judge is the fact finder. The judge is the decision maker, not the jury. A lot of things are allowed in, some hearsay, um, some allegations that might not be as reliable or admissible enough at trial that were allowed in here. But the defense is allowed to ask questions. The defense is allowed to cross-examine. They gain information. Sometimes it's a fact-finding mission, which it's not supposed to be for the defense, but they were allowed to do that in this case. They were allowed to make arguments, which they did in that preliminary hearing. 
And they basically argued there's not enough evidence here. This should be out. That should be out. One of the things they argued the judge shouldn't consider is that prior attempt on Eric's life. Hmm. The judge said he did consider it and he did find that there was probable cause and enough evidence to go forward to go before a jury. It doesn't mean she's guilty. It right. doesn't mean she's found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. It just means the state has enough evidence at this point, some of which we're telling you on this podcast, that even the judge says at this point as an unbiased party, there's enough here. There's enough smoke. It seems like there's fire here. We're going to eventually let a jury decide unless she takes some kind of plea deal. And did you say that some of this that was expressed may not be led into trial? So yes. it was it was before the judge enough to give him say uh, to say, OK, let's move forward. But they may not even mention it at trial. So there's more and less. Right. So there's definitely going to be more witnesses and more evidence presented at trial than was presented before the judge. You mm -hmm. only have to get enough to cross the bar of uh, probable cause, which is, you know, likelihood not beyond a reasonable doubt, which is a much higher standard. If we're putting percentages on it, maybe probable cause is 50s, 60s percent, you know, high 50s, 60 percent that the defendant did it beyond a reasonable doubt in the 90s percent, right? It's almost positive. Basically, you get rid of every reasonable doubt. But certain hearsay items are not allowed in or the way it was presented where they just give the court a document that somebody else filled out, an affidavit. You're allowed to do that in these types of hearings, but you have to actually call the witness to the stand to testify. You have to actually produce the actual evidence before the jury that you might not have to. You can kind of present almost the whole case file to the judge and he can look at it. Um, and he can even go through statements and depositions potentially that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily do a trial like that. And is Corey's defense attorney, what is her role in this preliminary hearing? What is, what is, what are they trying to accomplish? They're trying to poke enough holes or show how lacking the evidence is that judge, no way any juror ever thinks that, that, um, Corey Richens did this. There's not even enough for probable cause here. She should have never been arrested. She needs to go home. And, um, at this point, the, the case is over. There's just not enough in this case. They're not necessarily presenting a lot of evidence. They can, they get to cross examine witnesses again to poke holes. The vast majority, like 99% of preliminary hearings, the state wins you. Cause again, it's already the, 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 uh, Law enforcement has already had to find probable cause to arrest her. The state has already had to find that there's enough there to move forward. The judge is just the third step. It's all probable cause. It's not exactly a high bar. The state almost always wins. So that was not a surprise in this case. So Corey, once she was arrested behind bars, I guess what I've heard what I've, I, I, is that multiple times she was given the wrong medication and which caused her seizures because of this they decided about while she's in prison yes okay because of this they decided to search her cell because they thought maybe there was something in there that was causing this because the, how do you do that how do you mess that up that many times and while they're searching her cell they find a six page letter that she has written and at the top in all caps says walk the dog exclamation 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 has like some sort of i don't know deterrent like oh we won't read this <laughs> it's it's just her asking someone to walk her dog and anyway it is incredibly detailed well a lot of people said the walk the dog thing is like if you think you can trick somebody or you know we're going to show them or we're going to do this or that so they're not going to know what we're talking about go walk the dog while you read this. So nobody sees you. Other people have opined that there was other tongue yeah. in cheek to that. At the end, at the end, again, it said, uh, and don't forget to walk the dog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, Oh, okay. Um, but in this six page letter, to um, her mom. to her mother and, and she's asking her mother to also include her brother to corroborate some story about when Eric was in Mexico hunting, I guess there was an altercation between him and their hunting guide um, that goes back to permits, permitting, and he had paid this man well. They ended up not getting the permitting that they wanted, so on and so forth. So he had an, 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 an interaction and altercation with this guy in Mexico. And I guess what they were trying to do via this letter is to somehow have her mother and her brother corroborate that 
this man was part of the cartel. And that is how the fentanyl got into Eric's system. It was also talking about her previous attorney, who is no longer her attorney, um, trying to link this, link this trip. She, this, this attorney wanted to link this Mexico trip to his death. And that attorney is no longer. So first off, the attorney didn't tell her to do that. There's no, there's no indication to me that the attorney told her to do no. this. The way the letter is written is my attorney said we have to link, you know, Eric to the drugs or whatever. Correct. And when attorneys, when we do stuff like that, we're sometimes explaining to a client why a certain argument or theory will not work. We're like, we have no link. We would have to link that. Mm. And sometimes clients are like, oh, I can link that. Mm -hmm. Just let me talk to this person. You know, they know that, that, that. And we're like, oh, okay, great. If you have the evidence to link it, that's fine. But we need to link it. So Got sometimes it. we have those conversations and what clients do sometimes is go find the evidence. They don't produce it, but they're like, here's a text message. Here's an email. Now we have the link or here's this person that I know was there. Here's the link because it is their case and they know everything about it. So it's like, that's not that unusual that they would provide that link. But the letter definitely sounds like, I shouldn't say definitely. I think Corey Richards could say, I was reminding him of the story and I need him to tell the story. Um, but some people say that would be me going easy on the criminal defendant. She definitely saying, we got to get this story out there. He can make it short and sweet. Here's what he should say. But if mm -hmm. he wants to put it in his own words, he can't. She literally verbatim writes out what she wants him to say about this letter with Eric to try to connect Eric to cartel, to drugs, whatever it may be, taking the heat off of her. Yes. And the, so the letter is not, wasn't she charged with witness tampering? So there is some witness tampering allegations. I don't know if it was to do with the letter or something else, but in the letter, she also does something that I think is one of the most despicable things she's done in this case, which is saying something, but she wants to get at her sister-in-law, Eric Richen's sister. And so she says, mom, go get some pictures of the, the sister-in-law, Eric's sister's kids and send them out to a bunch of media outlets. That'll make her so mad. I don't even care if my kids are in it. That's fine too. Use all these kids to try to help us and intimidate her as a victim or a witness to me. That was one of the worst things she did in this letter. That is unhinged. I mean, beyond. Just imagine I that. I, I mean, can't imagine horrible. this being my sister-in-law. <laughs> how, how horrifying. How horrifying. And, I, you know, I was trying to think of it in like a, like putting myself, right, in this, in this scenario, minus, you know, the murder and, and whatnot, but families have drama. And I do think that there are a lot, it brings out the worst in people usually when there is a death, when there is money involved, when there's a lot of money involved, people act crazy. So I could see just on the basis of Corey's sister-in-law telling her you you don't get any of this 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 isn't yours this isn't your house Corey also assaulted her sister-in-law when her sister-in-law told her that she was not the beneficiary and that she had no rights to this home that she can't be breaking into Eric's safe her sister-in-law decided to tell her then that actually none of this is yours I could see why that would you know set someone oh, off for sure that, that would upset that. somebody whether yeah. you whether you're a murderer or not i mean i think anybody could look at that situation and say yeah that that would take someone off yeah I, I totally understand them hating each other at this point especially if you know Corey maintains her innocence if she didn't do it i understand why you'd hate if somebody accusing you of this and ruining your life over this and taking your kids away totally understand all that some of her demeanor after the fact has been kind of weird um, her, her lawyer is no longer on the case and you were kind of brought that up with the letter. Yeah. I don't know if it was anything to do with that letter. I don't know. There was also some other communications, potentially attorney client privilege communications that the state got their hands on. That's always a major issue. But at the end of the day, it was noted as irreconcilable differences, which mm -hmm. sometimes can be a wink, wink. Sometimes it means we just can't work together. And what that might mean is that I don't trust you. You don't trust me. 
You won't present the case in a way that I want you to present it. We can't work together. I can't be effective counsel for you. Therefore, I have to leave. There's been some allegations that she, you know, said she was a dumb B that Corey Richens was calling her a lawyer that. Um, hmm. There were some allegations from Corey Richens family uh, online that her lawyer had too big of an ego. Um, you know, so there were some of that back and forth, which again, sometimes relationships in these situations deteriorate. It sounds like that's what happened here. And that's why her lawyer is no longer on the case. She has two new lawyers on the case. One of the first things they did was the preliminary hearing, which they lost, which doesn't really say much about them because again, most of the time defendants lose the preliminary hearing. It was a pretty quick turnover. I think mm -hmm. didn't they end up having to move it because yeah. the lawyer, there was a delay and then they were able to get it together and do the preliminary hearing, which some people thought would last a week and it ended up only lasting like a day. Yeah. Which is kind of wild. Fast. It's a lot. There's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, what would you like based on what you know, what would you say her best defense would be at this point based on what we have, what we know, like wh where would you go with this? So, would so again, if I'm trying to come up with the perfect defense, I don't, again, I don't know the truth. So yeah, of course, this just only happened if she told me, you know, I didn't do this. This is the truth. What can we prove based on these facts? So assuming that that was true and that she really didn't do this, the only defense and the only picture I think I could paint just off the top of my head would be something like, and again, it's not rocket science. It's what she's already kind of going with too. And it's that Eric used drugs. He did this recreationally. He wanted to try fentanyl or you know, maybe there were some fentanyl lace gummies have been part of the situation that maybe he took, maybe he didn't at some other point. He wanted to keep pushing the bounds. He wanted more and more and more. And uh, Corey Richens was getting him some of these drugs. That's why she was talking to the drug dealer. He was taking them. They were taking them together. And, you know, he took too much or he got a bad batch of drugs and that's what happened. And she was trying to save face and not get in trouble because she knew it was going to look bad for her if she was getting in the drugs or doing the drugs with him or whatever. But just that they were partying, they were doing these, you know, um, substances together. And I feel like we've dropped the D word maybe a few too many times in this podcast, but um, they were doing them together. It went bad. He ends up overdosing. It was all accidental, but he was doing this of his own volition. That's really the only story I can tell that would help with. And she knew she was cooked once this happened. She knew it was only a matter of time that they were going to blame her for this. And maybe she thought it was illegal to do this stuff together. So she was going to get caught up in it, even though it wasn't an intentional homicide, which is, you know, what it ended up being charged. That's really the only thing I can think of because of the Google searches, because of the letter they found, because of the text messages, because of all the, I mean, I don't know how that really proves the financial stuff that she was doing in the background or her actions afterwards, but there's no perfect defense. It seems for this case. Um, the, the fentanyl aspect is really interesting to me because obviously there, it's a huge epidemic and I think everybody probably knows somebody who's been affected by it. Is it always investigated when there is a death like this or was this specifically investigated because of what the family was saying about Corey? So I think that it was a combination. I think it's possible this investigation was going on in the background and she just didn't know it. There's mm -hmm. no way they couldn't have looked at her as a suspect. And the family knew about a lot of these financial things. The family knew about the priors. My guess is this was just a slower investigation. Um, but it's kind of scary to think about that. And you know, hopefully they didn't slow down too much because she did have the kids you know, throughout that whole time. So I would bet it was a combination of, yes, the family, the family turning stuff over, a slower investigation than you would expect. Um, that's what I would think was happening in the background. But you say there's no way she wouldn't be a suspect. Don't, I mean, there are plenty of situations where this is by their own volition. Sure. I mean, uh, uh, plenty. And so that's why I think this specifically is so interesting because do they always assume that someone has been poisoned or so like, no, are they they... go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, or are they not, are they always looking at, the spouse <laughs> in a situation like this. So they don't ever like make assumptions. So they say there are multiple outcomes here. It could have been a homicide or it could have been accidental or it could have been, you know, he did it on purpose to himself. They look at all of those and they investigate all those. They don't just pick one. They're not mm -hmm. supposed to, I should say. They don't just pick the easiest one. They get other details. That's why you talk to people. That's why you uh, interview the family. You interview the spouse. You see what else was going on. You look at the records. Right. Um, you know, the financial stuff is 
can be very complicated as well and can take time to go through for law enforcement. So that could have been part of it as well. Like, does this really look like motive or does it not? Was her business successful or was it not? And they obviously have to make sure that what they get is useful. Sure. If and they reliable. Would, yeah. yeah. Like they, they, it has to be reliable. It could have been, sorry, it could have been completely void if they did it too soon, didn't have enough information. Of course. Yeah. You never want to jump to conclusions. That's the defense attorney's, you know, best case is, oh, they focused on one person. They didn't consider anybody else. They don't have enough evidence. That's how you can lose at a preliminary hearing. That's how you can get a case dismissed or a jury to where you don't even need a defense. Your defense is they can't prove it. They don't mm -hmm. have enough to prove it. They don't have enough evidence. That's usually the best defense. And the most common defense is just holding the state to their burden of beyond a reasonable doubt. They can't get there. Therefore you win the case. And if you jump the gun and you do things too quickly, when you don't have the evidence, that's usually the, the angle the defense takes. It seemed like in this um, hearing that they were questioning a lot of, of the, the interview that they did with this house Keeper, the woman that was employed by Corey that they the say dealer. she bought the, the dealer that they say she bought the fentanyl from um they were they were kept saying that she was you know led that really in the beginning she was like no I, she never asked me for fentanyl she asked me for whatever and that the cops kept saying to her oh do you remember this or how about this do you remember this and I guess they were making a, a big point about the fact that she really didn't get to her statement without a lot of help from them she, they also made a really good point about they never looked or tested any of the cups in the house which i thought was crazy because if she's telling them i made him a drink mm -hmm. and now he's dead you would think that would be one of the first things that you look into like what was in this cup where is this cup but apparently so anyway i think all of that is really interesting and i think it'll make for an interesting trial yeah. And I think that's the big difference between these hearings and the trial, right? Yeah. So when the state just gets to present what the informant was going to say through a cop and the cops, like the informant said, this said that said the other, that's not good enough for trial. The informant's going to have to testify a trial. So it, it was not as clean as it sounded. She said different quantities. She said different drugs. She didn't lead them down exactly what um, the state wanted them to in the interview. There are multiple interviews where she's inconsistent. She gives mm -hmm. kind of different statements. All of that is going to be just nuked at trial. They are going to make her look unreliable. She's in fact an informant dealer. So she just kind of starts out where the jury's probably going to question her veracity and whether she's telling the truth, but defense lawyers will have a heyday with her. But at the end of the day, if she does come around and say, Hey, I sold her this on these dates. And then you have objective text messages, uh, printed out that say, I need more. And you have cell phone data and car data that they went and drove to the same spot and they met up with somebody else. She met up with the dealer. I shouldn't say see, she, the dealer met up with somebody to get the fentanyl, then met up with Corey Richens right after Corey Richens met up with the dealer to get the fentanyl. Then right after she went home and mm -hmm. shortly after she made the drink when and Eric passed away. So it's like, no matter how bad or inconsistent an informant's testimony is, if you have other objective evidence and by objective evidence, I mean, you're not twisting it. You're not coloring it. It's not somebody telling you how good it is. It just is what it is. It's in black yeah. and white. It's printed. Nobody can mess with it. When you have that objective evidence building a timeline, it, it can corroborate even an inconsistent informant's testimony. And that's what I think the state is going to do. And that's what it sounded like they were doing through law enforcement who was putting it together on the stand before the judge at the preliminary hearing. This is... I mean, if the, if she did this, if if she really does over, I mean, a house over money. Money. I mean, it's, just, it's the, I mean, it's crazy to me. The number one motive in the world. It's like money, sure. rage, sex, love. You know, whatever. I mean, that that's what it is. It's and they've set it up where it's like, why not just get divorced? It's like there's a lot. The, the state has an answer for that. That's going to mm -hmm. be a question I think the defense asks because whenever I talk about this on my channel everybody's like, why didn't they just get divorced? I wish she just would have done that. It would have been better for the kids, better for Eric, obviously better for Corey, obviously if she gets convicted of this, but it's like, yeah, but that doesn't, that did not get her, her end goal, which the state's yeah. going to present. So yeah. that that's how the state's going to present it. But I think you brought up some good points that the defense can make. They're going to be able to say, you didn't test this. You just didn't test that. Um, you didn't test, 
uh, anything that could prove she actually did it? Did you have any, uh, uh, fentanyl in her possession that you can prove? Can you prove the fentanyl even went from the dealer to Corey, to Eric? You can't connect all those dots. You can't connect all those loops in the chain. So they definitely have some arguments, but I think it's just kind of like how you opened up the podcast. If the state attorney can tell a good story and a compelling story that the evidence backs up, especially the objective evidence, it's going to be an uphill battle for the defense even mm -hmm. with the presumption of innocence, even with the high burden of beyond a reasonable doubt, this story kind of tells itself. And it's a ugly, bad story that, you know, we as criminal defense lawyers sometimes say the generally bad guy rule or the generally bad gal rule stuff starts piling up. And you just think that person's a bad person and you can't let them out on the street. And, and sometimes they, they pile that mountain high and it becomes very difficult for a jury. We've also seen a lot of juror interviews. I've interviewed jurors before, and once it starts to snowball, sometimes it's impossible to get ahead of it as the defense. And this case tracks like that. Um, there's so many different aspects of law in this case. There's real estate fraud, insurance fraud, murder, illegal drugs. I mean, witness tamper. I mean, there's so many different crimes and areas of law here. How do they separate these things for a trial? Or do they separate them? Because they seem so intertwined. Like they all kind of ebb and flow in this case together. And do you think, sorry, do you think all of these accusations will come up in this trial? So yes, I think they will, especially the financial ones, the fraud, the death, the drugs, all of that's going to come in because all that goes to motive. They prove the case, they tell the story. So that's all good that the state has enough that they think it's good for the state that they mm -hmm. think they have enough to prove those one, each individually. So there's two ways that you deal with this as a prosecutor in this kind of case. And for anybody that's new to the podcast, so I prosecuted cases before I went out into private practice and defended cases criminally and now prosecute cases civilly as a plaintiff's lawyer. But you have to put together a case in a way that's digestible and understandable for the jury. Mm -hmm. So the way you explain life insurance policies and things like that is a state attorney can't just you know throw that stuff against the wall and explain it in argument. You have to actually present evidence. So the way they've already done that in hearings, the way they're going to do it at trial is with experts. So they have real estate experts. They have, you know, probate type legal experts that they're, they should shorten up as much as they can, explain what it means, explain what would have been the difference. They're going to have a family law expert probably break down the prenup and explain the difference in money that Corey Richens would have got if she, if, if it would have ended in death or ended in divorce. They're going to have a real estate expert explain that while she was flipping houses and it may have looked successful, her business was failing. She had all this debt. She needed to get into this new project. She needed the money. They're going to explain that stuff to make it seem like this dire situation, her back was against the wall. That's what created a motive for her to do the unthinkable. So they have experts to do that. Mm -hmm. But then when you're dealing with all these different aspects and different charges legally and criminally, that's the job of the state attorney. You have to present evidence and argument for each individual charge. And in closing arguments, when you can connect all the dots, put it all together, put each individual cause of action up there with the elements you have to prove. Here is what we have to prove for fraud. And here's how we proved it to you. This expert said this, these text messages from Corey Richens said this, her letter said this, this witness said that, that's how we prove this crime. Okay. Now we're going to get to the killing. This is what we have to prove. This is how we proved it with this uh, evidence, with this testimony. And you have to go methodically. And mm -hmm. sometimes you have to be patient. You can't speak too quickly. You can't confuse the jury. You've got to go one by one to make sure it's all in a nice bow and the jury sees that you presented evidence to prove each individual crime. You don't just throw them all together because that can get confusing. Like you said, so mm -hmm. many different aspects, so many different experts, so many different legal arguments. You don't want the jury to get confused because confusion is usually good for the defense. It's mm -hmm. usually come down to, well, the burden's so high, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. I don't think they got there because we're just all so confused. What did they really prove at the end of the day? That's what you have to make sure you don't, the trap you don't fall into as a prosecutor. So just as a lay person, somebody, you know, we, we did a, a episode one time of you being called for jury duty um, and you didn't make it on the jury. But so if you're a juror in this case and you see all of this, do you think it would make it harder to convict or easier to convict knowing that there are all these different legal aspects? And what would you look for from the state to kind of put all this together? Um, I do think that I need hard truths. I mean, there, obviously in my lame brain, I'm like torn over, torn over the, the emotional aspects and the, and the testimony and like the drama of it all. And I, I mean, that is, it, it is a spectacle. And I would look at this case and be like, 
obviously. I mean, I so, think so. So you're, it sounds like you're saying if I presented the story the way you presented the story today, regardless of how complicated the charges are and stuff, you're thinking she's so horrible and despicable for doing X, Y, and Z. I'm just going to vote guilty on everything. Yes. If I, if I didn't, if I didn't have like hard evidence otherwise or, or really good, like holes in it, you know what I mean? Like I need, yeah. I need you to tell me that who, who else did this and why did they do that? You know, I would need a really good, because looking at this, it seems it's just, it's like a waterfall of horrible allegations. And honestly, sometimes that does work. Like some of the worst cases with the most despicable criminal defendants, they can have really complex charges. They can have pages and we've, we've covered like Daryl Brooks and he had like pages and pages of charges. Some of them complicated, some of them not guilty across the board. Because I think once you prove the person sitting in that chair did these despicable things and is a horrible person, you gain credibility with the jury and, and you make a good point. They probably just end up checking guilty at the end if they believe what the jury or what the state says. And they believe that that's proof enough beyond a reasonable doubt. And the defense did nothing to poke any holes or create reasonable doubt or highlight reasonable doubt. If the state covered all of them up and excluded all the reasonable doubts, sometimes that's how you get to a guilty verdict as well. And it doesn't have to be as methodical and perfect as, you know, sometimes lawyers think it mm -hmm. has to be to convince, you know, a lay person and a juror. So there's so much going on in this case. Yeah. There's Google searches, there's children's books, there's shocking evidence, there's poisoning, there's text messages, there's letters being written. It is literally a made for TV movie that is going to get to trial one day. It does not seem like she's going to plead guilty. It does not seem like they're offering her any good plea deals. Usually you would have to run that by the victim's family. And in this case, as you've already mentioned and highlighted, it does not seem like there's a lot of mercy or grace there from the victim's family. So it seems like this one is trekking towards trial. Um, so anybody listening to this, if you guys want to leave a review, please do. If you want to leave a question about this case in the review, we'll try to take a look at them. Maybe we'll do a Q and a episode at some point. If you're watching on YouTube, throw your questions in the comments, hit the like button on the YouTube page. Whitney, thanks for bringing another case here for us to break down. I'm sure we will have more, but until next time we're out of here. Bye. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tregos, the lawyer you know.